I'm, uh, my name is Robert Nicholson, as Paul said, and thank you so much, Paul, for, for convening this and really just your leadership and, and sort of bringing the Providence conversation to the local community, which I think is exactly what needed to happen. Um, I'm the executive director of the Philos Project. I, um, I, what I do there is, our, you know, our official mission is promoting positive Christian engagement in the Middle East. And uh, essentially what we do is we try to educate American Christian leaders and future leaders across a variety of fields, both in the church and beyond, on uh, important issues of liberty and justice in the Middle East so that they can speak out. Uh, we believe that the American government only does, at the end of the day, what the American people tell it to do, or at least that's the way it should work. And if you want to move the government, you have to move the people. And a great way to move the people is to move the church and Christian leaders. So that's what we do. We educate toward advocacy. Uh, and we, we, we have to work on the Middle East because, well, the Middle East is, is a really important place. Um, philosophically, theologically, spiritually, we know it's, it's, it's important. Everything we have, every, everything we are, in a sense, comes from there. And also, just so happens that strategically, it's, it's, it's incredibly important, although some people may disagree, namely our president, uh, for, for our country's interests, uh, our economic interests, our security interests, and lots of what happens there tends to end up over here. Um, and so we think it's important that the American church knows what's going on. Unfortunately, why I founded the Philos Project was you, you sort of get in the space of American Christianity and you find that there is, and this is a little bit of a simplification, but there's sort of a bifurcation of responses to what happens in the Middle East. One is to say, uh, let's just bomb the crap out of them, you know, show them who's boss, and we have some people saying that right now. Another response is to say, either just leave it alone, it'll sort of go away, or, uh, you know, very well-meaning Christians say, look, the only hope for humanity is the gospel, so let's just send missionaries and sort of leave it at that. That's where our role ends. And I think that uh, if we recognize exactly what, what Chris said, that we are, uh, in some real sense, uh, dual citizens of, of both the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man, and trying to figure out, okay, how do we work out these two loyalties, and how do those two things meet in me uh, as, a, as a leader, and what is my responsibility, and how do I think about both and how they relate? So, Philos is really trying to promote sort of a biblical vision for how to engage with the Middle East. An important thing that we do right off the bat is exactly what I just said, dividing uh, the church from the state. Um, and I think Mark uh, mentioned this earlier, in the West, and I would argue embedded in Christianity as a whole, and thus in Western civilization, is this, is this division of labor, so to speak. And, and you think about what is a proper Christian response for, for anything, it's important to ask, Okay, what is, what is the distinction between the church's response and the state's response? Now that often, there's often an overlap, uh, as I said. I mean, our society as it stands today stems from biblical sources. So there's a lot of common language. I mean, human rights language, I would argue, comes in a very real way from the Judeo-Christian tradition. And so it's, you're able to speak uh, to both spheres. But what the church does, the state can't do. And what the state does, the church can't do. And so it's important to think about those different things um, before you start making decisions. So what I wanted to talk about today was trying to answer, I, I think, what is the implicit question of the conference. And that is, how do we as Christians engage with the Middle East? And there's sort of a, a subtext there of engaging with Islam. And I am not an Islamic expert. Um, I, I study the Middle East, and Islam obviously is a huge part of that, but there are people, there's particularly one person coming immediately after me who will be much better placed to sort of dive into the intricacies of Islam. But I think uh, I want to talk just briefly about uh, something I wrote in the first issue of Providence, which is the red one, I call them the red one and the blue one. Um, the red one, where I lay out, uh, I have a conceptual essay, and it's called Toward a New Vision for the Middle East. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and then I'm going to segue into the, the sort of safe haven northern Iraq conversation. I'll bring Juliana to talk a little bit about the trip and what we're doing. Um, I'm going to try to do this quickly. But um, really, I wanted to provide 
sort of another perspective on the way that we think about the Middle East. Um, and it's not exhaustive, it's, it's the beginning of a conversation, that's how I phrase it in this article, uh, but I think it's a conversation that needs to happen. And it's interesting, I was reading the other day, I have this fascination with articles or memos or single pieces of writing that in and of themselves changed history in a very significant way. I just I find that uh, incredibly fascinating. And I was reading um, uh, George Kennan's uh, seminal article in Foreign Affairs back in the 40s called The Sources of Soviet Conduct. And it's just it's fascinating to go back to the beginning of that, that, uh, that civilizational crisis and to read, like, how were people thinking this through, particularly how was George Kennan, who was so influential. How was he thinking about it? Uh, and it's just, it's an amazing uh, piece of writing. If you haven't read it lately, you should go back and read it. Um, and, you know, as I'm reading it, I'm realizing, like, this is sort of similar to what's happening today. We're over here. There's this force over there that's a mix of ideology and sort of hard power. And it seems like it's deeply entrenched. In fact, it's growing. And uh, we don't really know how to stop it. Uh, and, and we're really worried about it. We, we think that this thing really has the potential uh, for, for taking over the world. And that's, I don't think that's being too dramatic, the way that many Americans feel. And so, you know, we sort of forget about that early moment in the Cold War and how that felt. But it's interesting, as I'm reading what Kenan wrote, he says something like, um, he's talking about, this is toward the end of the essay, and he says something like, uh, the Soviets perceived this as a, a duel of infinite duration. Um, and, you know, he goes on to say that, well, this, this may not be so infinite. We can sort of wait this out. We can contain it. We can do all these different things. And if you know the article, you know what, what he says. Um, and we'll, you know, look, the time is on our side, and we're the better society, we're, we can win this, is what he says. And it struck me, you know, he's saying the Soviets perceive this as a duel of infinite duration, and I'm thinking in our own context today about Islam and this, this thing that's just sort of hanging over the world, and I think we too have sort of taken this uh, idea on, that this is a duel of infinite duration, and this is, you know, people sort of freak out about you know, Islam, and it's going to take over the world, and this is, you know, I don't know if you can beat this thing, and every time you smash it, it pops up somewhere else. Um, and there's, you know, we feel some truth to that, because we've seen it in the last 14 years. Um, and so, I'm thinking about that, and then I'm thinking about uh, another article that came out uh, immediately after September 11th, written by a guy named Michael Duran, who's one of my favorite thinkers. Uh, he's at uh, Hudson now. And Michael Duran wrote this article that eventually, you know, propelled him into the White House under, under President Bush, where he, he wrote an article called Somebody Else's Civil War. And it was at this moment, right after 9-11, where people were asking, like, what, where do we go wrong? Why do they hate us? And all of these things. And Michael Duran, to really boil it down, he says, it's not, we're not the only people here. These people, like, September 11th was symptomatic of a sort of intra-Islam fight. And we're kind of the indirect casualty of that. And he, he, it's, a, it's a great, another great article uh, that I think you should go back, we all should go back and read, where he sort of disentangles and kind of deconstructs this idea of this speeding train of Islam coming at us. Um, and this, you know, these two articles in some way and some other experiences I've had have led to the writing of this article. And I think, you know, for, for me, there's a fundamental assumption here, and that is that the best approach to sort of engage in the Middle East is to treat the problems from there, there. Treat them there. I think there's a, there's, again, there's a sort of a tendency to want to disengage, and there's also a tendency to say, look, you know, particularly with Christians of the Middle East, let's just get them out of there and, like, let that place burn. Like, just forget it. You know, that, that, that's not going to be fixed. So at Philos, there's a fundamental assumption that uh, long-term, thoughtful, a steady engagement with the region is what's best and trying to treat the problems at their root rather than treating them uh, in their symptoms. Um, and I think it's important just to sort of summarize what I just said is that I think we kind of overstate in some ways this, this civilizational crisis. 
because in a lot of ways it's a sort of it's not a clash of civilizations so much as it's a clash of civilizational clashes. Um, it's a you know it's not so, a sort of a giant boulder being catapulted at us. It's sort of a handful of stones that are being thrown at us. And I think that uh, until we sort of grasp that, that this is a very complex and fragmented uh, world, this Islamic world, uh, then we're really not going to be responding in the right way. Um, and it's going to be too big, and people are going to say, just leave it alone and let it be. Um, because the reality is we're not worried so much about Islam as we are about this sort of radical, violent, expansionist Islam. And that's, that's sort of what we need to hone in on. Yet even within that, there's all of this diversity. Um, I wrote in my article, contrary to popular conceptions, the Middle East is not a monolithic sea of Islam or a swarming hive of hostile Arabs. It is a mosaic of religions and denominations, languages and ethnicities, cultures and subcultures that have interming intermingled but remain disparate for thousands of years. And if you go to the region, as I've been multiple times, maybe not as many as Chris, I don't know, uh, it's really diverse. I mean, people, it's just really not what you think it is. Uh, if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. Um, even uh, within the Arab world, there's all kinds of division. Um, and, you know, I wrote uh, another sentence from my piece. I said, my opinion was the fundamental disease of the Middle East is a crisis of identity coupled with bitterness toward the West and a paralyzing fear of rival communities. What happened after World War II was the implosion of the world as they knew it. Everything just disappeared almost overnight. And there was this frantic search for some material element upon which to build this new society or set of societies. Uh, we came in, uh, and we weren't alone, and redrew the map as we heard. Um, we set up a couple of kingdoms, we tried a couple of experiments, Arab nationalism came on the scene to try to, uh, you know, sort of be a corrective and bring that culture back to its, its authentic roots. Arab nationalism failed. People thought, well, maybe the most authentic thing we can build upon is Islam. And, the, and, and, and in the 60s, 70s, 80s, Islam suddenly became much more important, and you see that going until today. Uh, what I suggest in the article, and I don't want to belabor this point, you can read it, but that it's, it's important that in a, thinking about engaging with the Middle East, we shift our thinking just a bit. I, don't, I won't say that this is entirely new and novel, this is just sort of a, a culmination of lots of different opinions, but it's rather be always thinking about the, the sort of engagement with Islam as an ideological war only, which that's a big part or a military security war only. I, I also think that there's sort of a, a structural, even a, a territorial solution, a governance solution, that a lot of people aren't talking about. And really what it comes down to is saying, look United States, look world, stop trying to engage the region uh, in a way that looks this similar to us. You know, in our mind we want to make the Middle East look like the United States. We want big multi-ethnic states where everybody's sort of equal, one man, one vote. And we've, we've papered over what I call the deep map. And that is these organic communities, sometimes they're religious, sometimes they're ethnic, sometimes a combination of both, that predate all of these things, that see themselves as, uh, as one, that identify as one, and that think collectively in a real way. I mean, of course, there's always disagreement within these communities, but they're real communities. The, the Shiite Arab, Arabs of, of southern Iraq, uh, the Sunni Arabs of, of western Iraq, the Kurdish Sunni Muslims of, of northern and north, northeastern Iraq, um, and that's just in Iraq, these groups do not think the same. And you know, a fundamental you know, cornerstone of US policy in Iraq, really up until today, has been keep this country together at all costs. And I'm not an advocate just for busting it up, but I think it's important that we think about, uh, okay, maybe these communities, uh, they want different things, and they're big communities. Uh, when, when we came in and we put uh, Maliki in as the, as the ruler in Iraq, that immediately sent a signal that was perceived by all Sunni Muslims inside Iraq as, okay, they're trying to push us out. They're trying to push us out. They're bringing the Shiites in. Our rapprochement with Iran didn't help. 
Uh, and now across the region, we're perceived to be pro-Shia and anti-Sunni. And we sort of chalk that up to sectarianism, but what we don't realize is that it's our sort of conceptual approach to the region that creates the conditions for us to make these mistakes. Um, I, if, you, if you read the article, you'll see, you'll see how I lay some of this out. And, and what I say in the article, and I say it numerous times because I'm very careful not to say, okay, this isn't the strategy for engaging Iraq or the Middle East, but it's, a, it's the beginning of a new conversation that needs to happen. And uh, I think it's important that we recognize uh, the differences. And I think, you know, it's not comfortable to say because you're sort of talking about dividing people. Uh, and and it, it's, uh, you know, it's never a happy time when you want to divide people. But it turns out that both in the East and in the West, the policy of, of good fences make good neighbors actually works. Uh, if you live next to a guy who's got a really annoying kid or annoying dog, you put up a fence, and you guys get along much better after that. Uh, and there's something about feeling secure in your own space uh, that allows you to make more rational decisions, that allows you to talk over the fence with the guy in the next yard, and that allows you, uh, it gives you some sort of impetus to improve your property, to improve your lot, and to really engage in the world in a different way. Um, I think it's, it's very biblical, um, is really something that I often point out to people. Really to me, when I think about ISIS and what it is and what it's doing, ISIS is, a, is like a black ink stain that's spreading across the region, trying to turn everything else black. It is a universalist, supremacist movement, like all of these radical Islamic movements, and really all totalitarian systems. It's an abolishment of difference. You, there is no dissent. Uh, you buy into this vision, or you get out, or you get killed. And this utopian, uh, universal, tyrannical vision was, you know, quickly raised and disposed of in the first what nine chapters of Genesis, where mankind thought, okay, that's the way we're going to go. We're going to sort of all coalesce into a city. We're all going to be one people. And we're going to do one thing, and we're going to build a monument to ourselves. And we're going to run the world that way. This was to be after the flood, if you believe scripture. This was immediately after the flood. Human history could have gone any number of directions. And everybody said, we're going to do one thing, and everybody's going to be in it. And God immediately scattered that and said, no, 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 I want difference. So much so that he, he created languages and pushed these people out across the world. And I think if you read the Bible, you'll see very much that God is a God of difference. He's a God of, of nations. You know, this, the beginning, our moral departure, as, as you mentioned, Chris, it comes from God's moral departure. God embedded freedom into the world. He wants people to choose their destiny in different ways. He likes that. It's interesting that the God of Israel, when you read the, the beginning of, of Scripture, the Torah, he's, here's this God in ancient history, a God, you know, a world of tyrannical, bloodthirsty gods. We're telling the people to do all sorts of uh, sadistic things. And he tells the people of Israel... You have from there to there, and you don't get to go any further. That's all you get. And by the way, I think in the first or second chapter of Deuteronomy, don't go harass the Moabites, leave the Ammonites alone, and don't touch those guys because that's not for you. And you see this God creating limits around all kinds of things all through Scripture. He's a God of limits. He does it on purpose. He didn't have to create oceans between continents. He wants mankind to sort of brush up against hard edges. And I think that if we're going to think as Christians uh, about the region, then we'll think about it in terms of emphasizing in a positive way uh, difference. And I'll talk a little bit about the, the negative uh, you know, pushback uh, to the idea too. But this, it's not just a biblical vision. It's not just a Judeo-Christian vision. There's something very uh, sort of self-interested about the idea as well. It turns out that, you know, people often say, well, the Middle East only works when you have dictators uh, running over everything and just suppressing all kinds of dissent. Well, it turns out that that's most necessary in systems where you have lots of competing communities. So Saddam Hussein comes in, he's got Kurds in the north, Sunnis, some of which don't like him in the west, and Shiites in the south, and he immediately has to sort of just lay the law down and start killing people because... It's the only way to govern a hodgepodge society like that. 
Am I in the dark here? <laughs> um, once you change the structure of the society um, to the extent that you can, it turns out that people are a little less paranoid. You don't have to, you know, if you're in a, a Shiite land, you don't have to worry as much uh, about those Sunnis getting in your business. Uh, and there's something, you know, people say, you know, you think about Saudi Arabia. As a Christian, it's appalling. You can't build a church in Saudi Arabia. You can't, uh, you can't practice your faith. Women can't do any number of things. And yet we know, we're thinking, you know, realistically that, well, you know, Saudi Arabia is sort of a force for stability. So how do you square those things? Um, and sometimes those are hard calculations you have to make. But I would argue that some sort of relative stability, uh, which is really what our foreign policy is always seeking after in the region, is much more uh, likely to happen when these communities feel safe within some sort of space that's in some real way their own. So, you know, people will say, well, okay, fine, but like, do you, are you really, do you really want to, you know, emphasize nationalism and sectarianism? Isn't that the root of the problem? Um, I would say, uh, of course, there's a problem. Once that nationalism or that sectarianism becomes fascistic, then you're in, then you're in a bad place. And there's lots of things that need to be talked about how to, how to guard against those things. But it's important, particularly on the state side of things, to take the world not as it ought to be, but the world as it is. And I do believe that uh, human beings were meant to live in communities. It's not wrong to say, I want to live with the people who are like me and believe like me. That's, there's nothing fundamentally sinful about that. I think that's actually quite fine. Um, uh, but it's important as, you know, if, if American foreign policy begins to take this idea and, and put it into, in various ways, into its foreign policy, it is important to build safeguards against some sort of, uh, some sort of fascism. You know, you think about uh, the KRG, the Kurdish regional government. Lots of Americans think those people, they're fighting ISIS, um, you know, they're, they're better than most over there. Like, they should have their own state. Um, and, and, you know, I would sort of be relatively inclined to agree. The problem is, though, when you have big states, ethnic states, minorities, such as Assyrian Christians in this case, uh, often face all kinds of problems. Uh, the education is, uh, is, is Kurdish, Kurdish history, Kurdish uh, politics. The... Um, Lands often get stolen. I raised this when we were in Iraq. I raised this with the Kurdish Speaker of Parliament. He, to his to his credit, he conceded the fact. He said, "Yes, it's a, it's a problem. We're working on it." And I think to follow this vision, it's important that we recognize the importance of protecting minorities inside even those kinds of states. Another pushback I get is, "Oh, you want to carve up the Middle East and all kinds of independent states?" And I say, "You know, you don't." don't like sovereignty, you just want to sort of meddle and change things and all of that. Um, the first thing I say is I'm not necessarily only talking about independent states. There's different ways to localize governance and localize, localize politics. And I think, you know, another question I get is, well, where do we implement this? Is this just a policy we do across the Middle East? No, you, you do it incrementally as opportunity presents itself. I think right now the most obvious example where we could begin to think about this is in the context of Syria. You know, there's no worry about sort of, uh, you know, undermining a sovereign nation there. I mean, this is just a big, broken mess. But as we think about, you know, who's at that peace table and what does a final settlement look like, I think it's really important to be thinking about, okay, the Kurds in the north and the northeast don't want necessarily what the Christians who live just south of them want, and the Alawites in the west, they don't want that either. In federalism, uh, different structures of local governance uh, which are being talked about, thankfully, need to, be in, need to be implemented in the conversation. So I'm not necessarily talking about carving up the Middle East again, although I support 100% uh, Chris's idea of having some sort of uh, regional uh, conference, and it may take a, a series of years or even decades to sort of sort out, okay, what does this new post-ISIS Middle East look like? Um, you know, you're, another pushback I get, well, you're talking about uh, ethnic homogeneity, that doesn't work so well. Um, I would argue, and I think Paul mentioned in his opening remarks, I have a lot of experience in Israel. A lot of people don't know this, who don't know Israel, but there is about 20% of the population that are um, Arabs. 
they, they speak Arabic, they have their own schools, they have all these different things, they have the same rights as everyone, that there's social discrimination at times to be sure, but when polled, overwhelmingly want to stay and remain and be contributing citizens inside the Jewish state of Israel. Uh, so there are ways uh, to protect minorities and even empower minorities within the context of these other states. Um, and, you know, one very common pushback I get, and I think it's one of the most uh, merited, is to say, okay, <laughs> that sounds nice as you sit in New York uh, and, you know, draw this on your whiteboard. Well, what if, you know, are you just, you're coming in and dictating a future to the region. Um, and, and isn't that exactly what caused all of this in the first place? And I would say, no, actually, all I'm doing as a Westerner is acknowledging the diversity that's on the ground and the wishes of the people themselves. When you talk to Assyrian Christians, when you talk to Kurds, when you talk to uh, Shia uh, in the south of Iraq, they very much want to protect themselves and they kind of want to be a community. They, they don't all want to destroy Iraq tomorrow because that would be catastrophic, but they want to be, they want to self-govern in a real way. And so in the West, what's worse to keep imposing our sort of America uh, vision upon the region or to acknowledge what really most of the people on the ground want anyway? Um, as I said, you know, people ask, okay, how? Syria is a great example. Another great example is Iraq. And Chris mentioned this. And Chris and I, we work a lot on this issue of safe haven. So uh, I'm not going to, you know, he gave a great introduction here. But, you know, one of the things, here's a perfect example of a non-overly uh, interventionist approach. This idea of a safe haven, which re in reality, and oftentimes people forget to describe it, myself included, really what we're talking about is a new province inside larger Iraq. Uh, it's a new province for minorities on the Nineveh Plain, Christians, excuse me, Yazidis, Turkmen, um, local protection, local security, with those very same militias that you saw pictures of, local governance uh, within a federal Iraq, but in some real way, uh, self-governing, autonomous. This idea, far from being kind of uh, pie in the sky, harebrained scheme devised by me, uh, has been on the table for a long time, even ever since 2003 and really before that. And it's provided for in the Iraqi constitution. It's provided for in the Kurdish regional government constitution. There's been a decision by the Iraqi Council of Ministers, the Iraqi cabinet, uh, January 2014, to do this very thing. The European Union has acknowledged it in various ways. The United States government has at least sort of tipped its hat in that direction. And really, it's just sort of a matter of implementation. It's liberating Mosul, liberating the Nineveh Plain around it, and creating the conditions, both security and economic, for these people to live and to flourish uh, so they can come back home. And that is a perfect example of the kind of thing I'm talking about. These Assyrians, uh, they want, they're scared. They're scared of Kurds, they're scared of Arabs. They want it, they're like, okay, we need to do our own thing. Uh, it's interesting in that context, it's exactly uh, what Chris said. Although the Kurds want their thing, the Sunnis and the Shia and all that, in this little place, this is one of the most ancient parts of Iraq. And uh, I could go on and on for hours about the feelings that welled up within me when I was there. <laughs> Um, it's actually one of the most diverse places in the Middle East because this is really the, uh, the, the homeland of all of these indigenous people. Before the sort of tidal wave of Arab Islam came in, before the Kurds sort of moved in from the east, this, this Mesopotamia was where all of these people live. And you go there, you hear different languages, you hear Assyrian, you, you meet people named Sargon and Ashurbanipal and all of this stuff. And it's a real, it's a real culture. And so although a lot of what I'm talking about is, is sort of creating more ethnically and religiously homogenous places for these people, in this place, it has the added benefit of providing shelter for a variety of peoples, all of which are fine with living with each other, more or less. And that was one of the wonderful things that I saw while I was there. Um, so I, you know, how do you, what do you do with this, you know? I think for one, this has to be more on the state solution side. This is not going to get created uh, with a bunch of churches sort of rallying together and saying this needs to be created. And so what, what, what I've created is, is a safe haven round table that I chair with Chris and other like-minded NGOs at the table where we're trying to hash out, okay, how do we do this in a real way? How do we prepare a plan? You know, people talk about it, but there's really no plan uh, yet. 
and how do we bring people alongside of us from important uh, places in the Pentagon, on Capitol Hill, in the State Department, uh, to support us in this. And, and we've, we've, we're making tremendous bounds, thank God. We, I had a meeting uh, yesterday at State, a meeting uh, before that on Capitol Hill with our friend Drew, Drew Bowling, and uh, really trying to figure out, okay, the moment seems right. ISIS won't last forever. As Chris said, one of the worst things that we fear is catastrophic success. You know, either we win, and then we're suddenly like, well, okay, what do we do with it? Or ISIS evacuates uh, under pressure from outside, and that void will be filled by somebody. And it's important that we, as the, as the American government, and as uh, the sort of community of nations, are ready to protect these minorities and allow them to return home uh, rather than have to be scattered all over the world. Um, but once these plans are created, uh, you know, we're working on white papers and events and all of these things, and I'm happy to sort of update anyone, uh, keep you on our email list uh, if you're interested. It is important at that point to get the church together, get Christian leaders together, get people to see the value, the resonance, both within the biblical vision, but also in the, the vision sort of, of of American foreign policy, that this is a good idea. And uh, Chris elaborated a lot on the Assyrian contribution to the world, both culturally and religiously, and I think you know, at the very least, we should feel as Christians that we, we owe something uh, to these communities in the hour of their greatest need. It was, it was our pleasure to participate in various ways on the genocide uh, work that, that happened. Uh, and this question of what next is really uh, the most pressing question, I think. And it's a shame that it's been lost in the mix of sort of uh, presidential politics. And uh, it's important that we uh, bring it back to the fore, and we start thinking about the Middle East as it wants to be thought about. So, so that's what my article is about. That's the stuff that we're working on. That's just one thing we're working on. We do trips to the region. We do educational initiatives and all of that. But this, I think, is really the most pressing, pressing question, the one that uh, I was thankful that Paul asked me to talk to you about today. So, Paul, what's my time here? You're pretty much done. <laughs> pretty much done. <laughs>